Decision. Welcome to the D-List, the show where I know what I'm going to do today. I'm going to list things while my name begins with a D. As you can probably imagine, I am quite excited for Milo Murphy's Law, the new series from Dan Povenmire and Jeff Swampy Marsh starring Weird Al Yankovic. Let's take a moment to appreciate that we're seeing such a convergence of talent within our lifetime. And in anticipation of the new series, I thought it only fitting to once again look back on Dan and Swampy's previous show, Phineas and Ferb. I've discussed this show at length in the past, and I probably will discuss it again at length in the future, and last time I discussed it, it actually got the attention of Dan and Swampy. Um, so if you guys are watching again, hi, I really like your show, and in fact, I'm going to talk about some specific episodes I like. My 30 personal favorite episodes of Phineas and Ferb. Now, I'm only going to be talking about the show itself, not the bite-sized spin-offs, although they were pretty great. Especially Doof's Daily Dirt, I really wish that would come back. Doof and Schwartz Daily Dirt's underrated. And just to make it easier for myself to narrow down, I'm only including 11 and 22 minute episodes of the show. I won't be including the movie, the hour-long specials, or the two-parter Where's Perry, but they're all really fantastic and would probably steal all the top spots if I was including them. And even with all those limitations, I was still only able to narrow it down to 30 episodes. So let's not waste any more time. Hey, where's Perry? Number 30, Delivery of Destiny. While everybody in Danville goes about their regular business, we follow Paul the Delivery Guy, played by Christian Slater in the U.S. Yes, I just delivered to Phineas and Ferb. Yes, yes they are. In the UK airing of the episode, he was played by Simon Pegg. What'd you guys do, install a homing sensor? Actually, we just put a clip on it. Cool. Yeah, no disrespect to Mr. Slater, but the UK got the better end of that deal. Paul has doubts about his career as a delivery guy, even after he accidentally wins a radio contest to have Love Handle as his personal rock and Greek chorus. But as he delivers supplies to all the characters, he finally starts to find his role in the world. This is basically the textbook example of how the show could use our knowledge of the formula as a shorthand. We don't see a whole lot of Phineas and Ferb in the episode, but we always know what they're up to while we're focusing on this minor character, fleshing out the world of Danville and seeing how the rest of the citizens are affected by all our main characters. And the constant love handle soundtrack is a nice bonus. Number 29, tip of the day. When Phineas and Ferb learn that the tip of the shoelace is called the aglet, they think it's essential that the rest of the world knows too. This annoys Candace, who is pretty sure that this trivial piece of trivia doesn't matter. Meanwhile, an embarrassing old video of Doofs has gone viral. I won't stop Agent P, this is no laughing matter. Limericks. Limericks are funny. This episode runs on pure silliness as the ridiculous magical powers yielded by the knowledge of the word aglet are revealed. If you dish aglets one more time, I'll fray your head so bad it won't fit through your shirt hole. And it's all tied together by the absurdly catchy song, ensuring that none of us will ever forget the word aglet again. We're gonna die together. One word at a time. One word at a time. Number 28. Unfair Science Fair Parts 1 and 2. It's a summer science fair. Baljeet enlists Phineas and Ferb's help with his portal to Mars, while Doof works on the traditional baking soda volcano. And the events of the science fair lead to two separate stories, one involving Baljeet and Doof's development of their science fair projects while Candace competes against Brenda Song to get a job working with Jeremy, and one involving Candace paranoid that her friends don't want to hang out with her anymore, so she runs away and becomes Queen of Mars. Arguably, these are technically two separate episodes, but what makes them so special is how they work in tandem, with the second episode woven into the timeline of the first as an in between quill. That said, each part is still entertaining in its own right, and Queen of Mars is one of the catchiest songs from the whole run of the show, and that's saying something. I'm the Queen of Mars, I was invisible on Earth. It only took the magic portal to Mars to give me some self -worth. The show would later continue to explore this notion of two separate but related 11 minute episodes with the Pinky the Chihuahua stories. Unknown guy is out. Peace! Number 27. It's the bully code. I live my life by it. If a nerd should save a bully's life, the bully is the nerd's slave for life. 
Should is misspelled. When Baljeet saves Buford from choking, Buford forces himself to become Baljeet's servant, which is more annoying than helpful. Meanwhile, Candace accidentally texts some embarrassing pictures to Jeremy and tries to retrieve them before he sees them. Here, try something. I'm gonna go et gay the own thing. Oh, you know I don't speak Spanish. The bully becoming the nerd slave trope is an old one, as the song points out. Well, the story is old. It's a 70s sitcom cliche. But pairing it with Buford's aggressive misguidedness and Belgique's short temper just might make it the funniest example of the genre. Anything but go away. Number 26. Forget all your worries. Everyone in Danville is preparing for the big 50s doo-wop hop and car show. Lawrence is fixing up an old car for Candace, and the boys help expedite the process. You guys are so awesome! Doof tries to ensure his tank wins the car show with a rustinator, and Major Monogram tries to find out who Monty's dating. This may not be the most exciting adventure, and it may not go for the wildest laughs, but it's just a pleasant little event for the characters. It's nice to see an episode where everything works out for Candace. I was surprised and delighted that she got to keep her car at the end, and it didn't fall victim to the rustinator. Yeah, yeah, conflict is the building block of story and all that, but sometimes you just want to see the characters you like be happy for once. Plus, this episode contains my favorite Doofenshmirtz line of all time. Wait, red dust, rust. I wonder if that's where that word came from. I'm gonna go look up its entomology. Yeah, I looked it up. It turns out entomology is the study of insects. Go figure. Number 25, Lost in Danville. A mysterious hatch falls in the backyard and the gang tries to open it. Meanwhile, Doof has been kidnapped by the mysterious Professor Mystery, voiced by John Locke himself, Terry O'Quinn. Mystery is my allure. Ah, oh, this is gonna be a fun conversation. This was widely publicized as the Lost theme episode of Phineas and Ferb, since it had a story by guest writer Damon Lindelof, a guest appearance by Terry O'Quinn, and a handful of Lost references peppered throughout, but that wasn't the original impetus for this episode. Lindelof was a longtime Phineas and Ferb fan, and he had one important question for Dan and Swampy. Who's Peter the Panda's regular nemesis when he's not fighting Doof? Dan and Swampy had no answer, so they offered Lindelof the chance to write the episode about it. So basically, we're watching Damon Lindelof's Phineas and Ferb fanfic become canon. Well, alternate universe canon, but still sharing the same multiverse. But it works as a Lost-themed episode, and a chance for Lindelof to play with some self-deprecation as the most common critiques of his work are parodied. There better be a satisfying explanation for this when it's over, or I'm gonna be merciless on my blog. Professor Mystery's relationship problems with Peter are clearly representative of communication problems in real relationships, but at the same time, they spoof Lindelof's own trend of focusing so hard on being mysterious in his stories that he doesn't give you enough information to latch onto, to understand stakes and motivations and develop empathy. And I mean, I'd be so much more concerned if I understood what the stakes were. This is the heart of the mystery versus urgency matter that film crit Hulk wrote about, and here it's tackled clearly and humorously and in a Billy Joel pastiche. Talk to him. Tell him every twisted scheme that's in your head. But even without the lost jokes, it's still a fun character exploration of Doof, Perry, Peter, and Peter's life outside of Danville. This episode also has Jane Katzmerick and Rob Morrow, but we never got a Malcolm in the Middle or Northern Exposure themed episode of Phineas and Ferb. What gives? Number 24. Where's Pinky? Candace is meeting Jeremy at City Hall for lunch. City Hall serves lunch? I thought they only served subpoenas. Oh, come on! What's a guy gotta do to get a rim shot around here? But finds herself trapped in Wayne Brady's mandatory tour. Meanwhile, Isabelle is worried because Pinky's gone missing, as he teams up with Perry to stop Doof from simply taking the deed to the tri-state area. It seems he's discovered that whoever has the deed automatically becomes the ruler. It's an old law from a simpler time. Usually Pinky has his own missions to deal with, so it's fun to see the chattering little guy give Perry a hand. And Buford taking on the role of a dog to help track down Pinky is... Well, it pretty much just accentuates the Buford we already know and love. Good boy! Yeah, I'm a good boy, right? Yes, you are! Huh? Oh, that it better not be the mailman! And we learn a lot about the tri-state area in this episode. Although it's almost impossible to gauge if any of the information we learn is accurate in any way. I mean, it's all plausible in a universe as wacky as this, but then again, how reliable is our tour guide? I was sent by Yarnak to help uninformed citizens in need. Now, if you'll excuse me, 
I am needed elsewhere. Whoosh. Number 23, Hail Dufania. Norm, I know what we're going to do today. Ah, the classic formula switcheroo. Known in some circles as pulling a chicken roaster. Phineas's mad scientist side comes out when he schemes to create a rainbow for Isabella. Behold! The rainbow -inator. While Doofenshmirtz just wants to create his own place to get away. Aren't you a little old to be building a fort? No, no I'm not. Vanessa, who got Candace's dry cleaning by mistake, tries in vain to bust Doof's evil to her mother, while Candace is paranoid about her friends seeing her in Vanessa's clothes. Meanwhile, Perry, back from the vet, is just trying to get the episode started. This is not the first time Vanessa's Candace side has come out. They even shared a song about it in an earlier episode, but it only seems to be accentuated when they switch clothes. And this was the first time it was made blatant just how close Phineas and Doofenshmirtz are to each other. They've always been two sides of the same... triangle. But even when they're working on the type of scheme the other would usually work on, the thing that separates them are their motivations. Doof's driving selfishness versus Phineas's unstoppable altruism. Doof is trying to get away from everybody he knows, but Phineas is trying to make things better for everyone he knows. The episode also serves as a fantastic showcase for Norm, marking the first time he shows personality beyond just his use of 1950s catchphrases. Now where is he? I'm right here, sir. Number 22, Sidetracked. When Doof hijacks a train that runs right along the U.S.-Canadian border, it's time for international diplomacy, as Perry must team up with Canadian agent Lila Lollenberry, played by Samantha freaking B. Oh, shoot! I see we're trapped by societal convention. But he hasn't quite forgiven her yet for a past mission gone wrong. But the two must work together to stop Doof and his evil exchange program with Professor Bannister, played by Kevin freaking McDonald. You think that just because I'm polite, smell like pine needles, and overemphasize my teas, I'm Canadian? It's always a fun change of pace when the adventure takes us away from Danville, and Doof's great train robbery is an opportunity for plenty of comedy and plenty of action. Here's your station! Say hi to your wife for me! Oh, 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 well, someone's home early. The conductor says hi. Perry learning a lesson about working together is a little on the nose, but at least the song admits how on the nose it is. We're on a hand car. We're a real double header. It's a heavy handed metaphor for how we work together. And there's a real possibility that I will never stop laughing at the helicopter fight gag. This is people fighting on a helicopter, not two helicopters fighting. Oh, though that would have been cool. Yeah. It might have been more exciting. Let's take a look. No, that in my head. And everything wraps up with a surprisingly touching Ocean's Eleven tribute. Number 21, The Necessary Roughness. It's shopping day at the Superstore for everyone in town, and everyone's after Pizzazium and Phenionite. Except for Phineas, who's finally learned how to do some hardcore relaxing. And Linda's off on her own as usual. Doof needs the Pizzazium to power an innator, Baljeet needs it for a science prize, and Candace needs it as a lantern for Jeremy. Having so many characters going after the same MacGuffin is a great setup for hijinks, as Candace, Stacy, Buford, Baljeet, and Perry all get to engage in some slapstick hilarity on their quests. But primarily, this episode is a showcase for Vanessa and Ferb. Vanessa wants to prove her responsibility to Doof so he'll buy her a car, and Ferb wants to help Vanessa because... He's had a crush on her from a distance for a long time. No, I mean a really long time. Like, since they were in love actually together. This is Vanessa and Ferb's first extended interaction, and while it may not end in romance, it does start a camaraderie between them that carries on throughout the series. Well, Ferb, you certainly know how to show a girl a good time. Number 20. Birthday, All Isabella wants for her birthday is some alone time with Phineas, but he's too busy enlisting everybody to put on a big spectacle for her. I've carried a lot of squirming bags in my time, but this is the first time I knew who was in it. Meanwhile, Doofenshmirtz turns everything that bugs him into literal bugs, and Stacy watches a horror movie by herself until she discovers a big secret. It's always been clear that Phineas cares for Isabella, just not necessarily in the way she wants. And he doesn't really respond to subtlety, hence everything having to be over-the-top and grandiose. And Isabella's frustration with his well-meaning misguidance is relatable, although I still can't tell if the desperation she's reached at this point is funny or tragic. Awesome. 
But the real reason I love this episode is Stacy's subplot. She's always been an entertaining character, a relatively level-headed foil for Candace, but this episode changed her dynamic in a way I didn't see coming, and it just made me appreciate her even more. Number 19. Dude, we're getting the band back together! When Lawrence forgets his wedding anniversary with Linda, Candace and the boys scheme to reunite Love Handle, the band they saw on their first date. Meanwhile, Doof tries to put on the perfect Sweet 16 for Vanessa. This is the first time we see Candace working with the boys and actually trying to prevent Linda from seeing what they're up to, and it explores their relationship beyond the role set by the show's formula. It also explores Doof's genuine desire to do right by his daughter, even if his methods are expectedly misguided. And this was the first episode to explore Lawrence and Linda's relationship outside of the kids, fleshing them out into larger characters. The episode is also a tribute to music, with Jarrett Reddick showcasing a brief history of musical styles and how they evolved into each other, Carlos Ellis Rocky focusing on the stylish aspects of the music industry, and Steve Zahn exploring rhythm in the best library musical number since Mary and the Librarian. Steve Zahn has some experience playing a member of a one-hit wonder. Number 18. At your age. Are we ever going to see Phineas and Ferb as teenagers? Yes. Yes, we are. In fact, we're going to see it right now. It's ten years in the future. Phineas is trying to choose a college, but he gets distracted when he finally finds out about Isabella's crush on him. When she looked at you, her pupils actually formed little hearts. Like, I do not know how that is physically possible. She changed her eyeballs. And he starts to wonder if all of his adventures were just wastes of time, distracting him from what he should have focused on. Meanwhile, Doof tries to speed along a midlife crisis. Although there were two hour-long specials after this, this episode was in many ways the true series finale of Phineas and Ferb, or at least the finale for Phineas and the kids, giving us a peek at their future and where everybody would eventually end up. Although I couldn't help but notice that they left some questions open. Notice they deliberately avoided ever showing Linda and the kids together, or Perry and the family together, and thus avoided the question about if anybody found out about anybody else's secrets. We may have gotten a peek at a future happy ending, but there could still be room for other adventures along the way someday. But even if that doesn't happen, this is a nice place for our characters to end up. <laughs> I can't believe it. It seems like only yesterday we were drawing our first doodles of these kids. Yeah, I, I know, it's, uh, it's a sweet episode, but it's, going to it is, it's really, everything. it's just a cartoon, I'll just... Ooh. Number 17. The Chronicles of Meep. When a cute little alien crash lands in Phineas and Ferb's backyard, they get sucked up in his intergalactic hijinks. Meanwhile, Doof tries to retrieve his long-lost balloon best friend. This episode features a wildly eclectic guest cast, including Lorenzo Lamas, Meep. David Mitchell from Mitchell and Webb, I steal rare creatures from their homeworlds and imprison them here on my ship. Uh... You're a zookeeper? No, that sort of legitimizes it. Um... You're a poacher! Yes! And the one and only Don LaFontaine in one of his final appearances. In a world. There, I said it. Happy. The premise for this episode provides so much fantastic material, ranging from Isabella being hilariously bitter at Phineas's apparent obliviousness to how cute she is, to the cramming in of as many beloved sci-fi references as they can. Get away from him! Mitch! On top of all that, this episode introduced Doof's Raised by Ocelot's backstory. Bonus points for the audio commentaries, which were on a Toys R Us exclusive bonus disc, so they're a little hard to track down now, but if you can get your hands on them, they're absolutely worth your time. Number 16. Phineas and Ferb get busted. When Candace finally gets Linda to see Phineas and Ferb's dangerous invention, the boys are sent away to reform school. Candace revels in her victory for a little while, but soon starts to regret what she's done and becomes determined to bust the boys out. There had been some breaks in the standard formula in previous episodes, but this was the episode that proved that this show could do anything. This show has no limitations, other than maybe those set by standards and practices. This episode gets a little borderline preachy with its on-the-nose pro-creativity message, but at least it does it with plenty of Kubrick homages, including a very intimidating Clancy Brown going all full metal jacket as the sergeant. Of course, the events of the episode are undone by the end, because otherwise there'd be no series, and they're undone in a predictable way, but at least there's a healthy dose of surrealist dressing to the expected beats. And along the way, we get fantastic character moments, and the most emotional song ever to provide a dictionary definition for the phrase Little Brothers. Little brothers, cause you're younger, we're related. 
And we're halfway through the list now, so join us next week for the top 15. Until then, this is Dave, signing off. Carl, where's the rest of the list?